back in the mid 90s there was a the contour replaced the tempo and I personally kind of liked the tempo at the time I was I was there when it came out new and uh, it had a little cast iron engine that was like half of a V8 and uh, it had a the camshaft was in the block and it had push rods and the, and the cylinder heads were cast iron and I saw one of them one time that got so hot that the thermostat had changed colors like you heated it with a torch and because uh, somebody had just poured clear water in it and it had nothing but rust in the cooling system and so I put a radiator on it, flushed it all out, the thermostat, I'm kidding, I kid you not, it had it was gunmetal blue, that's how hot that thermostat got. She would drive it and would quit running beside the road and she would crank it back up and in those days they just had a red engine light that was for oil pressure or temperature, whatever your problem was. They didn't have a check engine light and so, but a lot of other cars did and so somebody down in Bonifay told her that, oh that engine light, don't worry about it, you know because they were thinking it was a check engine light. But anyway, she had had it probably so hot that it quit running about 30 times. And I flushed everything out, started it up, drove it. It didn't blow no gasket. It didn't burn no oil. <laughs> that thing was bulletproof. I mean, it just blew me away how much, it, how much punishment it could take in that regard. And if you drove it without changing the oil, it lock it up. But anyway, what we had here, uh, this was really a nice little head gasket recall they had when it first came out because the, they were leaking a little dab of oil down the front of the block. This is a brand new platform. I was working at the Lincoln dealership then back in the day. That was in 83. And they wanted all of those head gaskets replaced with a different kind of head gasket. They had some tacky blue stuff on both sides so that it wouldn't leak oil. And these head gaskets they originally put on there were just a head gasket that didn't have any adhesive on it. And uh, one of the reasons they hired me over there was because the older mechanic didn't want to work on anything front wheel drive. They didn't want to work on transmissions and they didn't want to work on electronics. And so they hired me to do all that stuff. And uh, anyway, the long and the short of it was I found out I could take this, we had a that uh, engine hoist thing we got back here and where it would roll on a trolley. I could roll that thing over there. I could unhook that cylinder head, take a brace off the back, pull all the bolts out, hook that chain hoist up to that cylinder head after I got all the bolts out raise it up about this far and I could slide that head gasket out of there and feel around under there make sure it was smooth because it was nearly a new engine anyway. Put a new head gasket in there, lower it back down, put all the bolts back in and in 45 minutes I could earn three and a half hours of labor. And I did a bunch of those. I mean and that was, uh, they, were, they were paying me pretty good money. Then too. But anyway, uh, that's what the head gasket, that's what the silver head looks like. And the uh, head gasket was easy to get out money. It didn't even have dowels in here. You know usually you have dowels but on this particular one, because of the cast iron head, you know, you need to do that. But anyway, so I went ahead and told that story there. Real good stuff. Let me see who's that. I think my glasses make me make it make me see somebody out there or something. Like you thinking I'm seeing somebody walking by the door. Well, in '95, Ford discontinued this little friend of mine and introduced me to this Contour, which appeared to be a close cousin of Mazda 626. It was basically the same car as the Mazda 626. And it was a whole new car, and I didn't like it. I used to the tempo, didn't like the contour. There's a bunch of reasons I didn't like it, but it was the first car that ever had a cabin air filter, as I remember. And it also had a variable cam timing on the exhaust camshaft, like we talked about the other day, for EGR purposes. Didn't recirculate EGR, and just closed the exhaust valve early and left some gas in there. All right, so everything seemed to be wrong about it. The shop manual procedures for the 2.0 call for the removal of the catalytic converter to replace the PCV valve. What's wrong with that picture? I'm pretty stupid or what? All right, so birth of a new generation is a Z-Tech engine. A little 122 cylinder, you know, um, uh, cubic inch displacement four cylinder engine, dual overhead camshaft, four valves per cylinder, aluminum cylinder head, sequential fuel injection. Seemed pretty reliable, but it had some strange issues on it. And it's a more complicated engine than the other one we were working on. Now the, it's got the the cabin air filter, see that right there, and it had the these deep variable cam timing, which basically on that one there, the way they did a variable cam timing, was they had some uh, helical gears, as I remember, and then it would move a little piston. The helical gears when they're turned, you know, when you're trying to put a distributor back in the 350, you got to turn it, and it, it's, it, it worked. They used that. 
to change the relationship between the cam gear and the camshaft when they wanted to change the cam time the old helical gear. All right, so it was used on cars for 10 years and even found a home in the Escape Hybrid. Uh, so that, that motor's still out there. You know, there's a lot of them bouncing around out there. Um, well, if you got a, one of these cars like this, and I talked about this a little bit the other day, with these low-tension piston rings that they have in there, if somebody tries to start it a bunch of, or if they start it a bunch of times to the point where they wet the plugs, it won't start, it squirts gas in there and washes the cylinder walls down. This one will sound like it doesn't have any compression. And we go, eee! But you can put some oil in the cylinders and get some compression back and it'll fire up. That you throw some new plugs in it. Uh, the older engines, like the old V8s and stuff, you might have seen them sitting in a barn when all the oil's gone from the cylinder walls and them little hard, I mean, them high tension piston rings are sliding up and down the way. They'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever heard an old one that's been sitting a long time it's turning real slow? And that's because you have to, you need to put some transmission fluid or something down in there and get it limbered up and then it'll start spinning faster. Anyway. Uh, but it doesn't typically bend the valves when the belt breaks, and that's a good thing. Uh, the early escorts did, the very early escorts, and Ford went back and changed those where they wouldn't because the, uh, they didn't want, they want to wear that. Now some of the escort 1.8 dual overhead cam ones did, but this is a dual overhead cam engine that doesn't bend valve. And the Toyota Camry is a dual overhead cam engine out there. In spite of the fact that there's only one gear on the outside, there's two camshafts under those valve covers. Uh, one year during spring break, I decided I'm going to go to the Ford dealer where I used to work just to see what was going on and see if I could help a little bit. So, this is a curveball. Ryan pulled the ticket on a 95 Contour that came out of a small dealer in Florida and somebody had popped a salvage yard engine in it, but they couldn't get it started. <coughs> That's disgusting, isn't it? So they dragged it to the local Ford dealer where the timer belt was replaced, but it still wouldn't start. Okay, now here we go. The compression sounded decent. And it would try to start, and it would backfire out the throttle body while the engine was spinning. Uh, and if there had been a distributor, I could grab and twist out of it, try to advance the ignition time. When you turn the wheels to the right and remove the splash shield, you can take the timing light and the number one plug wire and watch the timing flash while they spun the engine. And the spark was recurring 30 degrees late. Okay, so see, we couldn't adjust the timing. But the way I was troubleshooting it was, when is this thing firing its coils? You know what I mean? When is it firing? It was firing so late that there was no earthly way it was going to start. Now see, this is a way of gathering data that wasn't in any of the shop manuals, but I'm saying if I put my timing out on that number one and I'm looking at this mark, it ought to be flashing right there or close to it, but not way over here after top dead center, right? All right, so this confused some of the engine guys. They claimed the cam gears had to be out of time, but I says, look, that doesn't wash. Ryan had already checked the belt timing, and secondly, the crank sensor used by the EDIS ignition module to fire that call pack gets its signal from the flywheel. Has nothing to do with the camshafts. See what I'm saying? You gotta think about where's this coming from? It can't be coming from the camshafts because it gets it from the flywheel. And it couldn't care less where the valves are. Even if the valves were completely out of time, it'd still be firing where it's supposed to. Right? Like a sand. Thank you, sir. Um, all right, so uh, the, the crank sensor provides base time and engine speed information to the ignition control module, and it supplies information to the powertrain control module. You can kind of see how that's set up. And the profile ignition pickup signal is what they call a PIP signal. And the profile ignition signal that tells, uh, you know, it, it uses that for ignition, it uses it for fuel injector timing, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and there's your little EDIS connector. We talked a little bit about one of these things here before. And that's kind of the way the system laid out. You, know, you can memorize that. There will be a pop test on it tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Somebody had obviously put the flywheel in wrong. See how that flywheel looks? All right. And at the very least, the transmission would have to be removed. So the flywheel bolt holes will usually only line up one way, but somebody will leave a bolt or two out if they get a little frustrated. But one way or another, they put the thing in there. They just didn't have it right. They didn't even think about it causing problems with the crank set. See that wide one right there? You put that in the wrong place, that 36 minus 1 is what it is. It's like if you took one of these out, and you might notice down here on this engine right here, it's 36 minus 1. That's how that works. Hey, there's Ontario. Now some people join us, sir. All right. So, curveball number two. We worked together uh, out of the service for another one. And when he spun it, some of the cylinders had more compression than others. 
and it was a 138,000 mile vehicle, so we probably were going to have to have a time of bells on that one. Now, I will tell you, on some of these vehicles, if you're telling somebody, you know, what, you, what they need to do, what would you tell somebody if they came to you and said, I want my car to last a long time, it's not giving any trouble, what do I need to do? <coughs> No, I mean, they've already got the miles on it. They went, what do I need to do right now to extend the life of my car, you know? I mean, if it takes a time and belt, probably be a good idea to put one of those on there. And if it's a really high mileage car, hadn't had any trouble with a radiator, you probably ought to put a radiator in it. Just call. Those are plastic. Radiator splits, poof, lose an engine that way. And if it, or a belt tensioner needs to be replaced, you know, and all that too. A belt tensioner will break without warning, pop. And that happened time or two. So if we ever buy a high miles car, get the timing belt? You need to make sure the timing belt's been replaced. Now, I'll tell you what the deal is. Some of these cars, like for example, a Kia Cephia. If a Kia Cephia has gone past the timing belt replacement interval, it's just living on borrowed time. Because if one of those jumps time, it beats the crap out of the valves and they start snapping the heads off or they hammering around in there, they bust the pistons and they mess the cylinder. <laughs> You're putting an engine in it, man. But I mean, see, and I, and I got, we got an email through my website, which by the way, I'm having to rebuild my website, website is down right now. But the, I got an email through my website and these people said, we had this uh, Kia that we drove and it was, uh, we went uh, like a few thousand miles, two or three or four thousand miles past when the time belt should have been replaced and it busted on a trip. They still owe $3,000 on the car. Yeah. And now it needs an engine. And they said it was going to be $8,000 to put an engine in. And we stuffed one of those in that we got from a salvage yard for $1,500 bucks and got them all back on the road. But anyway, that timing belt needs to be replaced on time. And what happens if you tighten it too tight? Makes sense. Noise. You hear a timing belt making that noise after you put one on there? You tighten the timing belt too tight. Um, I can show you that on a Toyota. I can tighten a, a timing belt, that, that little Toyota motor, and it'll just wind up a storm. Anyway. So, you jerk the two bolts, to hold the top tip of the timing cover in place, found this fresh looking belt. Spun the gears when you turn, but the belt is pretty loose. Alright, now this is how you do that. This is the back side of the camshaft on the opposite end of the head. And you got this camshaft alignment tool. For my purposes, I got a file that would almost perfectly fit in there. And I ground it down on the grinder so it would perfectly fit in these side here. Let me make you a little caution right here. When you're working on one of these, do not depend on this bar to hold those camshafts while you tighten the bolts on the other end. Because if you do, you're going to bust one of these little parts of this camshaft off. This is not designed to hold the camshaft while you turn it. It's actually got some wrench bosses on the camshaft for that. And I had one of these engines here that was a trainer engine that we pulled out of a car. And I said, hey, I can show these guys how to do this. And, you know, first time somebody did the job, they busted a camshaft. Because they were trying to let this hold the camshaft while they turn it. It ain't strong enough for that. Anyway, so we pull the valve cover to access the camshaft. We brought it around to the place where the slots. See, so you don't have timing marks on this. Okay? No timing marks. You line those camshafts up. They won't line up but one way. If you got them turned upside down, you can't get that bar in there because it's resting on top of that head. Slide that thing in there. That locates your camshafts right where they're supposed to be. There's no keys or anything on, the, on those cam gears. They just got big washers, and they got a place where the, you know it pinches in there good and solid, but won't move. All right, this is where the we lined it. We should have been lined up. Well, the slots wouldn't line up, so at least the camshaft were out of time with each other. But we jacked the car up, put it on a stand, removed the passenger side wheel, and that's how you see this mark right here. Brought the splash heel and brought it up on TDC. Now the later model engines that they're using in some of the uh, Port escapes and stuff like that in the hybrid, they don't have a mark here. They've actually got a little place where you're supposed to take a little bolt out and put a pin in there that locates the crankshaft, kind of like you're locating the camshafts. So basically, you've got to locate that. And I've also over here in the other, uh, I'm going to roll this uh, one of these four liter engines out here where you guys have to use the tools to set up an engine without marks. Okay, because that would they don't have no timing marks on those. You have special tools to set them up. Well, another look at the belt shows the gears were several teeth away from where they should have been, so this thing was out of time. Well, he okayed a $60 timing belt and three hours labor, so we supported it with a floor jack. Be careful when you're doing that, by the way, if you put a floor jack uh, under the aluminum oil pan, you can bust the oil pan, <laughs> but put a board on it and it works okay. So 
Remove the balancer doesn't usually, it's not a big deal. I mean, you just usually jerk the retaining bolt off and pull it off your finger. Toyota Camrys are usually that way too. Uh, I mean the older ones. Removing the lower half of the time of the cover, you notice some steel balls lying below the crank gear. These little balls came out of that bearing. And so that, one of the two outer blows, it lost its marbles and it made the belt jump. Okay, so the slots and the tool, that's what it looks like when you've got it in there in the real world. Uh, once again, don't, let, don't try to hold that with it, you know. Uh, I've done it both wagon rabbits, and I knew how that worked, but we used to do the diesel rabbits that way. Same, same setup. And they're a little small flat bar, and I got, I got a file, you know, that worked for that. It's inserted, locate the shaft when time in the engine. Now look at this. This is really important right here. It's got an offset slot cut the non geared into both camshafts, and when they're lined up right, the lift end of the exhaust loader pointing forward, and the lift end of the intake loader pointing backwards. See that? Forward, backwards. Now see that little egg is pointing straight back and those are pointing straight forward? If you see that pointing, then you know you're pretty much right where you need to be. Now one time I put a guy at work at a shop over there uh, and he called and he said that this older guy that was working with him wouldn't ever line any timing marks up when he was replacing a timing belt on one that hadn't jumped. He would just leave everything where it was, pull the belt off, put it back on and hope everything be right. You get a tooth or two off, you got surgeon, you got bad gas mileage, you got dissatisfied customer. But he says, well, the problem was, after we got it put back together, it wouldn't start. You know? So I said, okay. He said, what do we need to do? And um, I says, if you've got it lined up like it's supposed to be, with those camshafts where they're supposed to be, and I don't remember what kind of car it was, but this is true on most all four cylinder cars. If those cam lobes are pointing opposite from one another, that's pretty much right where you need to be. So I lined it up like that and put the crank on, you know, TDC and it's good to go. Fired right up. Anyway, that's just a little something right there. Remember. Alright, the camshaft drive gear has got no keyway. See that? No keyway whatsoever. It's got a long bolt, a big old washer on it, holds the gear shaft. This is a real handy way of, uh, and it look it makes the belt easier to install. Well, basically, whenever you line that thing up, you know how a cam shaft, when you're trying to get it just right, you probably experienced that on this when you were working on, and it tries to go doom, doom. <laughs> you know, it doesn't want to stay where it wants to go. Mm -hmm. So we lined yours up with the lines, and then we put those little paper clip things on it to hold it in place. They've also got other special tools for holding those cam gears so they won't keep trying to move while you're doing things. All right. Well, near the crank sensor connector, you'll find this plug. There's a crank sensor connector right there. A little plug right here. You take a little plug out and you screw this special tool in there. Right there. All right. And say so that's 303574 is the tool number. Fits a machine slot on the crankshaft counterweight and that locates the crankshaft while it's installing the belt. See, even if though you've got the mark, you want to make sure it's located perfectly. So with everything put back together and these new outer pulleys in place, he turns the key. It started around two seconds and died. That's disgusting, isn't it? You ever have something like that happen? Think you're done? And I put in the engine, we were at the free will and sound of no compression. Yeah. What the heck has happened now? All right. Oh, we're getting to do it all over again. One of those situations where we were sure everything was done right, but prevailing circumstances. <sighs> okay, two minutes, the valve cover back off. We brought the engine around where the camshaft slots were lined up. They were lined up, crankshaft should have been in place, and it was right where it was supposed to be. Go figure. Now we installed the valve cover, he spun the engine and some of the cylinders started gaining compression. First one started firing, then another, then it fired up, ran rough, then it smoothed out. <laughs> What's going on here? You know? Alright, so this one has cam followers instead of hydraulic lifters that tend to get pumped up when the cam stops turning on a manual transmission that jumps out. The wash down the cylinder walls had to be what was going on. You know? Alright, test questions. Why do so many of today's engines have rubber timing belts instead of mesh gears or timing chains? A. Timing belts are generally quieter. B. Timing belts don't require lubrication. C. A timing belt uh, equipped engine is less expensive to design and build. Or D. All of the above. You need an answer sheet. Go look in there in my office and find him an answer sheet. There's one laying in there. Uh, 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 uh. Hurry up! All right. Two engines with more than two valves per. Oh, excuse me. Engines with more than two valves per cylinder usually have more than one what? You 
Crankshaft turn and an inline four cylinder engine between cylinder firing events. What you like? Oh, he came without a pin again, huh? Oh, oh, oh. Well, I am Yeah, okay. How many degrees is the crankshaft turn and an inline four cylinder engine between firing events? Technician A is working on a V6 engine with distributorless ignition. B says if a particular spark plug cable is removed or comes off the companion cylinder that shares a call pack with the loose cable will not fire. A says the companion cylinder can still fire and the only misfiring cylinder might probably be the one with the loose cable. That's a sort of a long question. And we covered this the other day. Too, by the way. See, technician A says if I pull this one, it's companion on that same call is not going to fire. Technician B says, yeah, well. Technician B says, contour is variable valve timing is a feature that enables the PCM to retard intake valve timing. Technician B says, contour is variable valve timing, variable cam timing enables the PCM to advance exhaust valve timing. Who are two times? Yeah. yeah. Who is technician A and who is technician B? Yeah. Well, Let's, let's call him A. The first one is going to be A. Boy, I really screwed that up. Sorry about that. I got two B's there. If intake valve timing on a given engine is suddenly retarded, that engine will what? Ping, lose power, gain power, or none of the above? transmission is placed in drive with brake clock and the engine's accelerated to wide open throttle. What information might be gleaned from watching the stall speed on a tachometer? The stall speed is when it quits when the engine quits gaining speed. You got it in gear, put your foot on a brake, park brake lock good and hard. Incidentally if you mash the park the regular brakes first and then mash the park brakes they'll lock harder. Wide open throttle in gear, where does it stop gaining engine speed? And that figure is actually there's a spec in the book for that typically. Technician A says the crank sits from a contour reads off a 36 minus one tooth trigger wheel on the harmonic balancer. Technician B says on a two liter 98 up contour the ignition time and the intake valve time it change at the same rate during a highway driving. Who's correct about that? Time and bell shift's been replaced and is making a blending noise. <laughs> what might be the problem? Who goes to the one, two, three, and four? What's that? One, two, four. One, two, three. Go back over it. All right. This one here should be delta. 
I'm gonna count, I'm gonna trust you guys to mark your answers wrong if you got them wrong, by the way. This one here, you usually have more than one camshaft per head. Usually, and I say usually, because the little Plymouth Neon or the little engine that's in these PT cruisers and stuff, a lot of the times they've just got one camshaft, but they got four valves per shoulder, which is a strange design. It's really cool. Uh, this one right here, first thing that'll be lost will be cylinder compression and valve time, B and C. That should be a delta. This is 180 degrees. What you do is you take 4 into 720 and you get the right answer, 180. 720 is two full turns of the crank. Technician A working on a V6 engine, blah, blah, blah. You know, this guy's wrong right here because it'll keep firing. And this is going to be, uh, look at that, A and A. Look at that, I screwed that one up too. We're going to say B. This guy, second guy is always going to be B, even though I screwed the question up. So that's going to be B. Uh, it's a feature that enables it to retard valve timing, uh, but not intake valve timing. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, it advances exhaust valve timing is what it does. It closes the valve early, leaves some exhaust gas in there. So six was what? Uh, six was actually yeah, five. Yeah. Yeah. That was Baker. Bravo, really. Baker. Uh, if intake valve timing on a given engine is suddenly retarded, it's going to lose power. Seven. Retarded, going to lose power. Vacuum gun drop. Uh, if you put it in drive wide open throttle, you can actually get A or B out of this one because the engine is not producing the power it should. You'll have low stall speed. If the condition of the one-way clutch in a torque converter is, if it's not going to have a good one-way clutch in there, you're actually going to have a low stall speed too. That's one of the ways if you've got a good strong engine is you can tell you got a bad torque converter by it's doing a, a stall speed. So that's Delta? Yep. Yeah. That's going to be, yeah. Um, so this one right here is going to be... Wait a minute, how did I do that? This guy right here is wrong. That guy's wrong. Because it, where is that? Where is that 36 minus 1 on this one? Remember? Yeah, flywheel. Flywheel, that's right. All right, technician <coughs> B says on these. And this right here, and B, is a, B is the right answer on that one. All right, a timing belt has just been replaced, making a whining noise. It's too tight. Problem is on that. All right. All right. So, what do y'all think?